on October 9th, 2013, season three of American Horror Story premiered. As many of you watching know and have pointed out, season three of American Horror Story took place in New Orleans and was titled Coven. A lot of the topics that we have covered on our deep dive for New Orleans were spoken about in American Horror Story, although we do know that American Horror Story took some creative liberties. Well, season three opened with a party in 1834 at the La Lurie Mansion in New Orleans. The very famous and talented actress Kathy Bakes played Delphine La Lurie. And if you remember, there was a scene right there in the opening where Delphine herself used on her own face to try to make herself look younger. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers on this channel. Without you, we simply would not exist. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today, Kind of on a mystery Monday, but also kind of not. We're going to be starting part one on our story and our deep dive into Madame Delphine La Lurie. All right, guys, I am actually recording this video on Zoom right now. I'm not in a meeting. I'm just recording myself telling you guys this story because my equipment is processing an interview that I just did with our TikTok queen, Liz. Now, the interview I did with Liz is airing on Thursday. However, we've recorded it on Wednesday the 15th, and I'm also recording this for you on Wednesday the 15th, because as you guys know, I do like to render my videos to YouTube earlier than they're being released, just so we can try to make sure we're working around some regulations that YouTube has placed on this platform. Now, most of you know that I have opened up a Rumble account on that platform as well. And some of the interviews that we do with other guests that are really potent, that's hard to really go through and mess with the audio to try to keep it on YouTube. I'm now just going to be putting on Rumble. Every time that happens, though, I will put a little video up on YouTube to help you link over to Rumble to watch the full interview, kind of like our friend Nicholas Vinyamin does. I think that's a great idea. However, in saying that, YouTube is still going to be our main platform. YouTube is obviously the platform that gets the most traffic. So therefore, for those of us in this community who are left on YouTube, we want to try to stay on YouTube because on these other platforms, it's a bit of an echo chamber. And we want to still be available to our friends and our family out there who are just now starting to figure things out, if you know what I'm saying. And they might not know about these other platforms. I didn't know about these other platforms until I woke up. So that again is why it's super important that we maintain a presence here on YouTube in order to help guide people to the information that they're looking for when they're just starting their journey. So I thank you all for being patient with us as we work around these regulations. I think there were a couple people in the comments who maybe were a little bit confused by this. So when we open up a channel or when you open up a channel, anybody is free to open up a channel on YouTube, you have to sign their terms of service. So it's their platform. And so there is literally nothing that any of us can do about their regulations. And right now they have a lot of regulations. From what I've heard, there's like a list of 300 words that you can't say, or it will trigger the AI of YouTube to like strike your channel. And we don't want that to happen. 
Again, that is completely out of my control. It's completely out of any content creator's control, regardless of what genre they're putting, posting their videos under, whether it's storytelling or entertainment or drama channels. None of us have any control over that. It is YouTube's house. Therefore, it is YouTube's rules. We just have to figure out a way to kind of work around it. So for those who are having a hard time understanding that, please don't get mad at any of the content creators who have to move certain things off on other platforms. I promise you, none of us are doing that to annoy you or to make your life more difficult. It is literally the only option that we have with some of our content. So with that being said, let's get started on our part one of Delphine La Lurie. Now, Delphine La Lurie is known here in America as an American and as a New Orleans socialite. Once again, she did play a prominent role in season three of American Horror Story titled Coven. Some of the adaptations of her story were accurate on Coven, and some of them were not. Now, American Horror Story, the series, the franchise itself is super interesting to me, and I keep meaning to ask Janine about it, because it does seem that there are a lot of um, dark C-U-L-T players involved with this franchise, However, I'm actually a fan of the franchise. I've watched every season of American Horror Story. I'm a huge fan of these kind of macabre stories. They're very fascinating to me, and the acting is really, really good. Now, we do know, again, with every single series, every single storyline they put out, they do take creative license with some of these historical characters that they bring to life in these stories. And again, Delphine LaLaurie is no exception. Now, I debated on whether to do her story as just a Monday mystery or as another deep dive on another day, because I do have a lot of questions around the legitimacy of her actions. We know that there's been a lot of folklore and tall tales and exaggerations on her story. And really, the truth behind her story is traumatic enough without all these extra bells and whistles that storytellers over time have added to her story. There was a part of me that even questioned if her story was real, though, because right now we know that half of the stuff we're told in life isn't actually real. But after doing this deep dive, I do believe that there's a lot more to her story and that she was a bit of a messed up person. Now, a bit like our story on Ava Perone, when I went back and reviewed her story, now that I know what I'm looking for, I did see a lot of red flags. Red flags that shout Luciferianism, that shout dark C-U-L-T activity. And so I wanted to like really break this story down. Now, most channels who cover Delphine La Lurie will really just get to like the gore of the story. However, as we know in our community, it's a lot more than just the gore of the story. We have to understand how the story even happened to begin with. And so if you're looking only for the blood and guts of Delphine's story, wait for part two, because that's when we're going to get into what she is known for. But here in part one, we're going to talk about what was happening in her world around the time she was born and in the early part of her life. We know that even for us as human beings living where we live and when we live now, that we are heavily affected by the collective consciousness, the collective karma of our world. So Marie Delphine McCarty was born on March 19th, 1787 in New Orleans. Now, something super important to know, and this is going to play into her story, is at this point in 1787, New Orleans in the territory of Louisiana, not just the state of Louisiana, was governed by the Spanish. For our friends out there who come from other countries, at this point, New Orleans was not a part of the United States. In 1787, the colonies, the 13 colonies beside New Orleans, were going through the American Revolution, which started in 1776 with Great Britain. The colonists in the colonies, the 13 states, 
Georgia, where I live, being one of those 13 states, were fighting their own battles against the monarchy of England, while Louisiana was still before then owned by the French. Now, if you remember, a few weeks ago, we did the bonus episode of what is a Creole and what is a Cajun. And we talked about the lineage of the Cajuns, and we spoke about the Seven Years' War, or as it's called here in America, the French and Indian War. In this battle, the French lost to Great Britain, which is why Great Britain was able to monopolize most of what we call Canada. Well, this loss also affected the state or the territory of Louisiana, especially New Orleans. So basically, to make a very long story, a very long and complicated story short, New Orleans was signed over by the French monarch, This at this point it was Louis XV, to Spain. Now, the interesting thing is the ruler of Spain at this point was a man named King Charles III. King Charles III was a cousin to Louis XV of France. They were both of the House of Bourbon. Now, we spoke a lot about the House of Bourbon, and we have spoken a lot about the House of Bourbon in episodes past. They were very, very, very satanic. I will include those videos down in the description box below if you missed them and want to catch up on them. We also did a deep dive with Janine a couple of weeks ago where we talked about the House of Bourbon and the founding of New Orleans. But nonetheless, the transfer of power went from France to Spain. Now, by this time, there were a lot of people living in New Orleans, mostly of French descent, some Germans as well, and a bit like their neighbors, the colonists over in the 13 colonies fighting their own revolution against King George III over in England, they had already, these people living in New Orleans had kind of already set up their own ecosystem. They had businesses going on. They had families there. We're talking people who were not immigrants anymore. They were born and bred here in this city. There were the aristocrats, the Creole elite that had certain powers that they had obtained within New Orleans when it was under French rule. And when the rule switched to the Spanish, the Creole elite got extremely upset and worried about their ecosystem of power that they felt like they had in New Orleans. Now, this is very similar, again, to what was happening next door in the 13 colonies, because the colonists had been living in the United States for many, what what we call now the United States, for many, many, many generations or a few generations at least. And they had their own life. They didn't want the rule of England coming in and telling them what to do when they were literally running their own country. They wanted independence. Well, the same panic arose with the Creole elite when the, pro- when the treaty changed hands from France to Spain. Now, what we have to understand about Delphine Lalaurie, who was born Marie Delphine McCarty, is that the McCarty clan was a very, very, very wealthy and very, very powerful family within the Creole elite of New Orleans. So they absolutely would have been affected by what was going on. Now, historically, in 1768, before Delphine was even born, there was what they call the Louisiana Rebellion, or this can also be found under the Creole Revolt. And this consisted of, again, the Creole elite unsuccessfully trying to reverse the Treaty of 1762, where Spain took over Louisiana. When Spain took over Louisiana, they originally sent a man named Antonio de Uloa. Now, as I said, I'm making a very complicated and long story, super, super, super short. So if you want to know more about the Creole revolt, there are many, many articles out there that you can read and lots of videos on it as well. So I'm just going to sum it up just so you kind of understand Delphine's family coming from this collective energy that's happening in their city right before she was born. Now, King Charles III of Spain, his really, his only interest in New Orleans was kind of the same interest that his cousins up in France had with New Orleans. They wanted to be a buffer for the English. They did not want the English being able to come past the Mississippi River. 
I don't think that Charles III was super interested in what the citizens of New Orleans had to say or about their little ecosystem of power that they had developed within themselves. And this new Spanish government came in, they had their officers there, and the Creole elite really pushed back, like big time. Now, their revolt was interesting because it was a revolt where there was actually no bloodshed coming from them. But what they did was so annoying to this new governor that it actually he fled. He left New Orleans. And after he fled New Orleans, uh, King Charles III kind of put a smackdown on the elite of New Orleans. He sent a man named Alejandro O'Reilly over to be the governor of the Spanish governor of New Orleans. And when Alejandro O'Reilly arrived in New Orleans, he arrived with troops. He was ready to put these people in their place. He quickly squashed this rebellion and arrested the six leaders who were in charge of this rebellion. One of the leaders passed away before judgment was passed, but the other five were publicly. Now, as I said, the only reason why, why I'm bringing this up is because we're looking at the deep dive and the information into Delphine Lalaurie and what would eventually become what she was known for. Most of you already know what she was known for. And so I want to talk about this Creole revolt, because again, this all happened before she was born. However, the McCarty clan, her family, her birth family were very much a part of the Creole elite. Delphine's grandfather had come to New Orleans as a high up military official in the French Navy. Now, a few generations before Delphine's grandfather came to New Orleans, her family was actually living in Ireland. McCarthy is a very big time Irish name. And a few generations before her grandfather came, their patriarch fled Ireland into France because of political upheaval happening in Ireland having to do with the English rule at that time. And so the McCartys had been living in France, therefore spoke French, probably very much identified as French, even though they were genetically from Ireland. So the McCartys had been in New Orleans for a couple of generations and again, were very wealthy and very, very powerful. They were part of that Creole elite. When the Creole revolt happened in 1768, a lot of the Creoles got in a bit of trouble with Alejandro O'Reilly. Well, here's the thing about the McCartys. The McCartys did not show their loyalty to France when the transition happened. They immediately then showed loyalty to Spain. And because they kind of took the knee to Spain, so to speak, they were granted even more money and even more power. Maybe this was because the McCartys already knew that this was all the House of Bourbon anyway. So whether it was France or Spain, in the big scheme of things, really didn't matter. I, I don't know. Or maybe they were just that conniving where they had no patriotism to, to a certain country. It was more about just saving their skin. Well, Delphine's father, a man named Louis, was one of 11 children. And when his father, the grandfather that had come from France, passed away in 1781, her father, along with his siblings, divided up the property. Now, in this time and this particular culture, women were inher allowed to inherit. This is a big deal because Delphine herself will go on to inherit her wealth. And so the property is divided. The power is divided amongst these 11 kids. And then her father marries her mother. Delphine's mother had already been married before. She herself was a very wealthy widow. And her name was Marie Jean La Arabla. I really hope I said that right. I probably didn't, but there you go. Now, again, she was a, a wealthy widow. She had inherited money from her husband on his passing. And not only did she inherit a lot of money, but she also brought with her a few plantations. No, not just one plantation, but a few of them. So here you have this widowed woman who is very powerful and very wealthy, marrying this guy, Louis, Louis, who is also very powerful and very wealthy. Both of them are powerful in their own right. Now, Delphine LaLaurie would go on to be famous for throwing her lavish parties. In fact, 
it was one of these lavish parties where she got caught doing what she's famous for doing. But she learned this etiquette, this technique from her own mother. Her own mother was considered to be one of the who's who of New Orleans social society. She threw lavish parties. And in fact, there are rumors that her parties, even in the 18th century, were very eyes wide shut, if you know what I mean. In fact, it is said that in New Orleans, you were not really anybody unless you were frequently invited to Delphine's parents' house to these lavish, somewhat scandalous parties. Well, as I said in the beginning, Marie Delphine McCarty was born on March 19th of 1787. She was one of five children. Some of her siblings came from her mother's first marriage, and then a couple were born with her biological father, Louis. Now, long before Delphine or her parents had been born, there was something called the Code Noir. This was introduced into New Orleans in 1724. Now, once again, I'm going to remind you guys, New Orleans at this point was not a part of the United States or the soon-to-be United States, the 13 colonies. So if you're familiar with the American flag, The blue and white, the white stars on the blue background represent the 50 states that we have in our union now, but the red and white stripes, the 13 red and white stripes represent the 13 original colonies of the United States. Louisiana was not one of those original colonies. Again, not a part of the United States. So when we talk about the slave trade that was happening in New Orleans, we're talking about a different trade that was happening in the colonies. Both were terrible. Both should have never happened, but... This type of business, human business, has been going on literally since the beginning of our time. I'm not sure how censorship is going to react to slavery, saying that word. So for this story, I am going to move forward, calling it forced employment. Now, I know that that doesn't give any type of of honor or vindication to people who experience that life. But again, we're working with regulations and censorship So moving forward, we're going to call that forced employment. So this Code Noir was about this forced employment and the regulations involving the management of this business. Now, this was based on earlier codes and regulations in other French-owned colonies. And another reason why I want to talk about the Code Noir in this episode is because this is going to come into our voodoo episodes, our multiple voodoo episodes that we're going to be doing soon. And I'm glad I'm starting with Delphine Lalaurie before we get into voodoo, because I think there's a lot that we need to look at before even looking at the voodoo of New Orleans, because there are a lot of crossovers here. So the laws in the Code Noir gave more rights to the forced employment people than the British or the Dutch empires did at the time. So some of these laws included all forced employed people had to be baptized into the Catholic faith. Again, that's going to come up in our voodoo episodes. And that all forced employed people were to have Sundays off for worship. Once again, that will come up in our voodoo episodes. Forced employed people were allowed to marry and families were not to be separated. So once there was a marriage in your home between these forced employees and they had a family, you could not separate them. That was very different than what was happening over in the colonies. They also said that there was to be no severe mistreatment of your forced employees And that interracial marriage was not allowed under this mandate. There was also a stipulation that the bosses of the forced employees or masters, that's what they're really called, um, could not free people. Instead, the courts had to do that. And there had to be a high price paid to free said people. Again, this will come into our voodoo episodes as well. Now, what were the punishments? So we know that one of the rules in the Code Noir was that a boss could not severely mistreat his or her forced employee. 
but we know that happened. So the punishments were usually just fines. If you accidentally were to one of your forced employees, um, then you would have to serve like a year in jail. But usually for some of these Creole elite people, they could just kind of throw money at the problem and make the problem go away. So these were basically the laws and rules of management that Delphine was born into. And obviously coming from such an aristocratic and wealthy family, they had a hell of a lot of forced employees. Now, when Delphine was four years old, another huge occurrence happened. And this huge occurrence will also play to our voodoo episode as well. You know, in American Horror Story, they played Marie Laveau and Delphine LaLaurie in opposition of each other, like they had a life together. Many of the historians that I've read said that probably never happened. They probably never crossed paths, mainly because Delphine was a good bit older than Marie Laveau. But there are like interconnected things that happened that kind of propelled both their stories. And the Haitian Revolution is one of them. So again, the Haitian Revolution broke out when Delphine was four years old. This was an insurrection by the self-liberated forced employees living in French-owned Haiti. It began on the 22nd of August, 1791, and it lasted for 13 years. It ended in 1804. The colony was granted independence. This was one of the largest forced employee uprises since the time of Spartaca, 1900 years earlier. So the Haitian Revolution, just in general, is kind of a big deal. And it really affected the other colonies like Louisiana. So here we have this very aristocratic, very rich Creole family who we know is spineless enough to just kind of go with whatever ruling body is in charge of them instead of actually being a patriot and standing up for their own country. We know that they have a code of ethics that they have to live by as the bosses of some of these forced employees. But we also know that they know there are ways around these regulations. Again, they can just use their power and money and influence and throw money at a situation if they accidentally go too far with some of their forced employees. We also know that Delphine was born into a family that had very scandalous parties that sound very familiar to some of the parties we're familiar with today. But then at the age of 13, something major happened to Delphine. She was forced to marry a 35-year-old man. This marriage took place on June 11th of 1800. The man was a man named Don Ramon de Lopez y Angula. He was a high-ranking Spanish royal officer. The wedding took place at the St. Louis Cathedral right there in the middle of New Orleans, a very, very famous cathedral that most people are familiar with in New Orleans, and one we will probably cover at some point on this channel. Well, even though at that time, 13 years old wasn't as creepy as it is now, how Ramon and Delphine met is very, very suspicious. Again, Ramon, when he married Delphine, was 35 years old. Literally, Delphine could have been his daughter. Well, the story goes that Ramon got to New Orleans in 1799. He had been married, but allegedly his first wife passed away. And so because he was this high-ranking Spanish officer, and because of the... um interesting tactics the family had taken by sucking up to the Spanish officials when they took over New Orleans, Ramon was wined and dined by McCarty's. He was brought in to their little parties. And the story goes that her parents, Delphine's parents, kind of pushed Delphine onto him as a partner. And when the relationship got very intense, they decided that it was time that they went ahead and got married. Well, because Ramon was a high-ranking officer in the Spanish court, he had to write a letter 
to the palace to get permission to marry Delphine. He wrote that letter and he waited and he waited and he waited and he waited. And eventually he just decided to go ahead and marry her, thinking that the Spanish court would obviously grant him permission because Delphine was a member of the upper aristocratic class. Why would they not give him permission? So again, on June 11th, 1800, they go to St. Louis Cathedral in New Orleans and they get hitched. Well, then scandal upon scandal after they've been married, they get notified by the Spanish court that they were not granted permission to get married. And now the Spanish court is super upset because he went ahead and married her anyway. So now Ramon has been summoned back to Spain. He's got to go explain himself. And so he takes with him his young wife, Delphine. Once they get to Spain, he is exiled in Spain and Delphine's kind of there. And there's all these legends and rumors of her enchanting the king and the queen with her beautiful dark hair. However, these legends seem to just be that legends. Eventually, Ramon was forgiven. And in 1804, he was allowed to head back to New Orleans. Now, at this point, his wife, Delphine, is pregnant with their child. On the way back to New Orleans, they are shipwrecked near Havana, Cuba. Ramon loses his life and Delphine gives birth to their daughter. Her daughter is called Maria Borgia Delphine Lopez y Angulera de Candelina, or just Borquita for short. So then Delphine gets back to New Orleans. She has this daughter and she's a widow. But while Delphine was away in exile in Spain, something else had happened in New Orleans. This, this of, course, of course, was the Louisiana Purchase of 1804. In the interim, Louisiana had gone back to the French Empire and Napoleon then had sold Louisiana to the United States of America. So Delphine was coming back to her hometown as now an American. In 1807, at just 20 years old, Delphine then marries her second husband. This is a man named Jean Blanc, and he is 43 years old. Now, Jean Blanc was a very, very powerful, very, very important person in the city of New Orleans. It is said that he was a banker as well as a lawyer, as well as a diplomat. And even though he was very powerful and very rich, he was also kind of a scumbag. In fact, you can find a whole document on how crappy this Jean Blanc was. But I wouldn't expect any less from somebody who is like a pseudo politician. But as you can probably imagine, at this point, Delphine's wealth is growing. She has the wealth of her late husband. She's also got her own inheritance. Now she's marrying someone who's also very prominent and wealthy. Her parents are known to be the who's who's of New Orleans. You kind of see where this is going, right? Like Delphine is not someone to be messed with because she has connections. She is powerful. And being this powerful, Delphine can do whatever she wants. At this point, she is untouchable. Jean Blanc buys them a house at 409 Boyle Street, right? down there, right in the French Quarter. Meanwhile, they also have a few plantations out in the country. With Jean Blanc, Delphine has four more children, three daughters and one son. This means that she has five children, four daughters and one son. By the time Delphine was 28, Jean Blanc passed away. The year was 1816. Now she was a widow twice over and twice over, doubly wealthy. But it's her third husband, a physician named Louis La Lurie, where the real nightmares of Delphine's inner world were exposed. And that ghoulish tale will be brought to you in part two on Friday. Thank you so much, guys, for sitting through this story. Let me know some of your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. Thank you again to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase the full opening song, there is a link down in the description box below. And thank you to Todd Roderick for helping me get this video out to you guys all today. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon. Bye.